Hi, and welcome to the Kent Archaeological Society's YouTube channel. My name is Fred Birkbeck. The Kent Archaeological Society is a charity based in the UK, and we are dedicated to the promotion and education of archaeology and history of the fabulous English county of Kent. Now, we have a number of videos on our YouTube channel covering all sorts of diverse topics by either our charity trustees or by invited guests, and you should check them out. Uh, you have some great information on there. We'll really hope you to understand more about what Ken has to offer. Now, this video is of a lecture given by one of our trustees, Chris Blair Myers, on crop marks and how to identify them, where to look for them, and whether they are really denoting possible archaeological features or not. Now, Chris is very well qualified to deliver this. Chris has worked for the Department for International Development all over the world on uh, digital mapping and photographic interpretation uh, for environs projects. Uh, he's also worked for Kent County Council on the environs team, and he has lent his fantastic expertise in aerial photographic interpretation to the archaeology sector, advising the historic environment team on potential archaeology in the landscape in certain parts of Kent. So Chris is a, a great boon to the society, he works tremendously hard, He's also responsible for digitising a lot of the grey literature from archaeology units in the county, which a lot of which you can find on our website. So if you want to support the work that Kent Archaeological Society do, please visit our website. The website address is below and uh, join. Uh, it's a very reasonable price to join as a member and you'll be supporting a charity that are really trying very hard to educate people on this great county. So I'll leave you with Chris's video. Just one minor point of interest is that the video is pre-recorded. So the cursor isn't exactly on the features that Chris is describing throughout the video. It's slightly to the southeast of where his cursor is. So if you see that um, for the first minute or so, you'll get used to it. It's the same all the way through the video. And also I want to give a special mention to Dr. Lacey Wallace of the University of Lincoln, who gave us permission to use some of the images from Bourne Park of the fantastic geophysical survey techniques that we use there and the results that came through and that pretty much ground truth what uh, Chris had interpreted. So please enjoy the presentation and support the KAS as best you can. At the end, there'll be a short question and answer session between me and Chris discussing his presentation. So please enjoy it. Good evening. Uh, today or this evening, I'm going to talk about crop marks. So what exactly are they? They are actually the visible effects of vegetation responding to differences in available moisture and nutrients, which is a bit of a mouthful, so we'll stick with crop marks. I have selected a number of aerial photographs clipped from Google Earth Pro to illustrate these responses and in some small way look at distinguishing between those that may have a response to archaeological features and those that have an altogether different cause. All bar one of the images are from Kent. First up, is an aerial photograph of the golf course at Sandwich Bay, which is the Royal St George's, uh, which is a dune system and it's been taken in midsummer after a fairly dry period. The dunes form ridges running roughly north-south, interspaced by low-lying slacks. The slacks are, the, uh, the, are closer to the water table and they have a higher humic content and are appreciably more fertile than the thin, free-draining sandy soils on the dunes that rapidly desiccate in dry weather. The brown parched grasses on the sandy soils can clearly differentiated from the lush green sward on the slacks. The closely mown fairways, which are these here, sharp as brighter strips, but they have no impact on the crop marks beyond improving the boundary definition between them. Similar effects can be a result of subsurface archaeological features that create variations in soil depth, causing vegetation over these features to show differential growth or ripening at a different rate to the surrounding vegetation. This is my a uh, drawing of my own wonderful hand. It's supposed to be wheat, but I'm sure the purists amongst you will notice that it does look remarkably like my maize. But what I have here is supposedly, say, a chalk uh, geology with a fairly shallow soil over the top. And in it, we have a ditch cut here, and then the remnants of possibly a wall and foundations here. 
And what I'm trying to show you here is that because the ditch has been backfilled and usually with a fairly nutrient rich um, soil, the crop over it will usually grow taller and moreover uh, be under less moisture stress. So it tends to remain greener for longer, whilst the crop either side of it responds in a normal way and is beginning to go to yellow and ripen. But as you can see, it still stays a dark green in the middle. Over the raised feature, the, uh, the soil is much shallower, so they have problems with root growth. It doesn't extend down far enough, so it has uh, less moisture, but also it dries out far more quickly. So effectively, it stunts the growth and it also, especially in wheat, tends to make it ripen earlier. Seeing the patterns that this perform, um, is created can be seen from the ground, but it is extremely difficult. So it's much better to actually look from aerial photographs where you can actually discern patterns more um, easily. Here I've got uh, a series of crop marks of ring ditches. There's a ring ditch here, another one here, and an enclosure. The sun is actually paced, as you can see from the shadows, from the bottom right hand corner. This is slightly counterintuitive because the eye is usually trained to actually have a light source from the northwest corner up here. And so some people may see these not as raised features, but as sunken features. If I flip it round so we get the shading from the northwest, hopefully you'll see that more clearly. And these now should be clearly seen as raised wheat in an otherwise flatter environment. This is a, a crop mark of a double ditched enclosure with a causeways entrance with other non contemporaneous boundaries running around it. Well, these ways we're not sure, but the fact is that this is in ripening wheat, but not fully ripe wheat. And so you can see over the deeper ditches, the, uh, the moisture has been retained and, the, um, and it's remained green longer. So it's a similar effect to the last slide, but this is to do with the maturity of the crop rather than just it growing taller. With modern agriculture and um, if you like with uh, the amount of fertiliser and how it's spread, it's quite unusual to see a crop growth differentiation, but you will still get to see this um, ripening effect. In fact, the soils associated with the big broad ditch here can actually still be seen as a soil mark running approximately there. So even though there's no crop, you can still see it as a mark. This effect is not just in ripening wheat, you can also see it in early spring wheat. And the next one, here we have a, an unusual series of uh, crops and um, crop marks, which the ring ditch is clearly obvious there and well marked with a slightly more wobbly second ring around the outside. And it could be that, of course, the, uh, they may not be contemporary, but what you have got is a very shallow soil over a chalk, uh, chalk geology. And in spring, uh, the wheat is taking advantage of the ditches, which has got a, a, a great depth of soil to actually motor on and effectively grow quicker. These numerous little oblong features here are in fact probably an Anglo-Saxon cemetery. And if you look carefully, you can see around here, there's a couple of small ring links with a, a central probable grave cut in the middle. And these are probably Anglo-Saxon uh, barrows. Elsewhere, where the plough has actually reduced the soil to a point where it's actually removed the, the barrows, you'll just see them as a very faint halo around the grave cut. The other feature here, which looks like a feature, but in fact it's a, a result of agricultural practices, because here we have a pylon in the middle, and where the, uh, the machinery tries to duck around it, you, you create these artificial square-like shapes and forms which can be very misleading if you don't notice that there's a pylon in the middle of it. Elsewhere we have other dishes, but you can't really be sure what they are. 
negative crop marks or parch marks are usually where the if you like the the, the soil is of inadequate depth and so you get moisture stressing in this case in grass and here you can see the rectangular form appearing of what is actually a Roman uh, structure uh, just near Y next to the River Stow. I've actually actually contrast stretch this to try and bring out that shape and form. What is less certain is whether or not this is actually caused by the actual foundations themselves since this uh, feature was actually dug in the 60s and so what we may actually be looking at is uh, backfill of the excavation trenches. So uh, there's some uncertainty about whether we're actually looking at the archaeology or the result of the archaeological interventions. It's really this obvious. So if I go to another example, this is actually in Fairlawn Park in Plaxstall. And you would have to be extremely well, you know, good eyesight to spot that in the middle of it, there is in fact a Roman building. Uh, it is barely discernible around about here. But this is normally what you get when you're actually looking through imagery, when you're trying to find crop marks, you really are looking for a needle in a haystack. And if I put on the excavation plan as it was subsequently excavated because of a pipeline going through it, uh, the proposed line went through there, which they actually changed to avoid going through the middle of the, uh, the Roman building. And you can quite clearly see here the Roman building there. If I then move on, what I can do is if I zoom in and actually do another contrast stretch on this, you can now see a little more clearly that is where the building is. And this is the new alignment that they made for the pipeway to avoid going through it. Negative crop marks in crops are actually quite rare. Uh, the 2013 image on the left uh, shows three small killer, circular features where the crop is stunted and pale. There's one, two, and there's a third one here. This isn't immediately obvious what we're looking at here. In fact, you can also see that there's a very pale line coming around here. So all those who have interest in uh, uh, um, second and uh, the 20th century uh, wartime defence systems will maybe recognise that. And if I go to the 1946 image, you will immediately recognise it as it's a heavy anti-aircraft battery. And what we're looking at is the, the gun platforms. Well, at least three of them are visible. The fourth isn't really really to be seen. So there are several factors that can influence the creation of crop marks. If the key element in variation is the soil moisture, the weather can be critical. And periods of drought, particularly in late spring and early summer, when vegetative growth is peaking, can produce particularly good conditions for crop marks. Winter drought, droughts may have very little discernible effects as the vegetation is dormant. And late summer droughts can have little visible impact on ripening crops or grasslands that are already parched and brown. In drought conditions, the speed with which a crop mark develops is very dependent on the nature of the soil. Soil consisting of coarse particles, sands, releases water steadily to sustain plant growth, but can be exhausted abruptly. Crop marks on these soils can develop in a matter of days. Soils consisting of fine particles, clay, retain water, releasing the moisture to plants at a decreasing rate as they dry. The reduction in plant growth takes place over a far longer period, and it may take several weeks for crop marks to develop, if at all. In both instances, a fresh fall of rain would restart the whole process. And even if weather conditions are favourable, there are a number of other factors that militate against the appearance of crop marks. Soil creep may reduce soil depth on the interflues and colluvium accreting in valley bottoms to a point where subsurface archaeological features are too deeply buried to affect the vegetation. Soil loss on the interflues exacerbated by frequent ploughing may reduce or completely remove all but the most subst substantial archaeological features. On subsequent crop mark mapping, this can give the entire misleading impression that archaeological features are concentrated on the gently sloping flanks of valleys. Here is an example taken from the planet. The dry valley, which is the dark green black, is actually only one metre lower than the surrounding land, but the difference in soil depth is sufficient to affect the crop growth 
obscuring a section of the World War II, I think, slit trench that runs across it. It would be there. So surface geology is an important factor where the composition of a ditch fill is very similar to the surface geology, as is often the case for clays or wetland soils. There is insufficient contrast between the ditch and the natural to create a differential effect on the vegetation, except under the most extreme drought conditions. For example, there are very few crop marks recorded in the Kent Weald and Clains. An excellent example would be the extensive Romano British settlement at West Hawk Farm, Ashford. The site was revealed by a geophysical survey conducted prior to construction of a large housing development. But although it's very extensive and complex, it had not produced a single significant crop mark in 10, 10 different sets of aerial photography flown between 1946 and 2013. The type of vegetation cover can also be significant. Natural grasslands are habitats that are composed of remarkably rich and complex mix of grasses and forbs adapted to site conditions. For example, chalk grassland communities are particularly suited to hot, dry sites and unlikely to produce parch marks even under drought conditions. So the complexity of the species mix enables the community to accommodate seasonal fluctuations in weather. What may be detrimental to one part of the community may cause the other to thrive, so there's no overall discernible difference in the vegetation when reviewed from a distance. Improved gar grasslands respond somewhat differently, as they are species poor, and they lack the adaptability of natural grasslands. Indeed, some grasslands are ploughed and sowed with a very limited variety of grasses and clovers and respond more like a cereal crop. They are often mown for hay or silage, or short, and the short sward should add clarity to clock marks. Although they can reappear when the cut grass recovers, free draining soils and alluvium, sands and chalk can provide a very marked contrast to ditch fields and under ideal conditions produce crop marks with remarkable clarity. Parch marks in these soils can be very fleeting if they appear at all, as the soils desiccate rapidly. These soils cover much of northern and eastern Kent, and for this reason, the overwhelming majority of crop marks recorded near Kent are ditches found on these formations. Pasture or immediately grassland where the sward is maintained in short grass can be more rewarding. Crop marks in lawn are usually produced by parching, Negative apart marks appear first as the grass browns over buried walls and pavements. But as the drought continues, the grass browns over the remaining shallower soils, leaving ditches as the greener positive crop marks. This is the Roman structural complex at Bourne Park in Kent, appearing as parch marks, which you can just see here at the edge. This was flown in 1990, and it revealed right in that northern corner next to the cricket pavilion the outlines you can see there. This is on the alluvial floodplain of the seasonal Nailbourne stream and it has been grazed on mown parkland since at least the mid 1800s. In fact, this is a, a very well known cricket pitch for those who are, have an interest in the game. It's been in existence since at least 1760 when the first county class cricket matches were actually played on that ground. So it has had no agricultural interference. When we look at a slightly later edition, this is in 2003, which was a drier year, but the aerial photograph was taken later. So already up here, where you saw the earlier marks, they've almost faded to nothingness because all the grass around it has already started to brown. But here you can now see what looks like a little T-shaped annex appearing. So this confirms that what we have is definitely some kind of structural complex of some kind. Fortunately, this uh, site has also been uh, surveyed both uh, by magnetometry and resistivity and in fact by ground penetrating radar. So I, what I'll do is I'll show you some of the results from that. So you can see what effectively you can see as an aerial um, photographic crop mark and what you see when you actually do say this is magnetometry. There's the T-shaped annex again. But to our surprise, when we did it, we suddenly found there's a whole range of buildings popping up over here on the right hand side. If I briefly revisit the story about the cricket pitch, these rather curious, um, if you like, dipolar responses here 
are actually 22, is it, is it a chain or 22 yards, I can never remember which, but actually are the stumps, if you like, for the, uh, for the cricket pitch, which must have actually been very, very heavily impacted on to actually create these marks over where the wickets previously stood. It was also done with the high res um, resistivity. Um, and this clearly shows up the, uh, the boundaries of the walls, including entranceways, uh, passages coming into the various rooms, and even what are probably quite substantial um, structural elements of the main entrance, which we think is this here. We also put a ground penetrating radar over the top, which I'll run through. Now, this is a, a movie, if you like, which is done by looking at uh, uh, the radar results done with five centimeter depth slices. So I'll run through this so you can see. That's the top. And now we'll run down through as we go down. And you'll start to see the walls of the structures beginning to appear. And we continue down through them. There's even a, a back wall that's here. And this is an apsidal end of which subsequently proved to be a bath complex at the end. And it will continue down until we get through out through the bottom of the uh, foundations and back into the natural. It did reveal a, a very broad ditch here, which seems to be uh, exist prior to the uh, construction of the building. But we don't know what period that would have been from. OK, let me see if I can now move on to the next one. Uh, OK, so crops are monocultures with very little genetic variability and developed to respond to uniformity of weather and soil conditions. This uniformity of response is very useful as all the crop above the archaeological feature will behave in a similar way, creating very clear crop marks. But not all crops have the same degree of sensitivity. Large crops like shrub or fruit orchards have deep and widely spreading root systems that reduce the sens sensitivity to localised variations in soil moisture. They still occur, particularly where the subsurface feature is broad and forms an impenetrable layer and is near the surface. An example below, flown in 99 and 2003, the apple trees planted in the mid 1990s have failed to reveal a curvilinear feature there's no certainty about what we're looking at here, but we suspect it may actually be the edge of an old Reichstone quarry. With a notable exception of maize, cereals can generate excellent crop marks. Their limited root, root depth and spread are sensitive to localised variations in soil moisture, and the close parting of the crop gives good definition, revealing small features in high resolution aerial photography. This is a field of spring wheat. The field boundaries and ring dishes are obvious, but it's also possible to see a line of pits or post holes leading from the centre of the image from here, going down towards the series of ring dishes down here. To give you some idea of just how good the definition is here, each of these pits is actually less than a metre across. So this is a very fine resolution that you're actually looking in a crop mark. The rest of the features, uh, uh, slightly more difficult to explain, but we suspect that these might be sunken feature buildings. I mean, the ring ditch is fairly obvious and it appears to be some other possibly later burials here. And again, this slightly wobbly second ring around here may actually not be contemporary with the first. Some of the others are fairly obvious. So we've got a trackway coming through the top and a, an enclosure here. Not all crop marks are archaeology. Although the aerial photograph for the sandwich dunes illustrates vegetative responses to differences in soil moisture that are natural in some instances, it can look remarkably like archaeological features. In North Kent, the Thanet beds, beds are formed of layers of clay sands, sands and calcareous sandstones in thin beds, and where laid horizontally and eroded, the small variation in soils can create patterns that look like archaeology. In this photograph, 
the resulting pattern looks remarkably similar to the banks and ditches of a small Iron Age port. In fact, it's not, it is rather small. Although saying that, uh, there is a small circular feature on the top here, which actually may actually prove to be a ring ditch. Equally, periglacial action on clays and sands can produce distinctive geological patterns. And this includes the polygonal ice wedges commonly found on the London clays in North Kent. They are strikingly similar to prehistoric field boundary ditches, as can be seen on the image from the Hoo Peninsula. Note the two faint ring ditches here and here, adjacent to ground, and the ice wedge polygons do pass through them. It is quite hard when you've got this sort of patterning to actually work out what is archaeology and what actually is a geological feature. In the corner down here, we have further what I think is archaeology with a field boundary ditch running here and here, but in here possibly it could be ridge and furrow. You can see these very closely spaced curving lines here. It is very hard to be certain on those, but trying to unpick uh, archaeology from this can be quite challenging. For comparison, I'm looking at here of an image of the Midway floodplain east of Tunbridge. Here we can see a, it's a similar pattern, but in this case you're looking at a network of paleo channels and former drainage dishes filled in by agricultural conversion from pasture to arable post-1946. Uh, these, this form and shape clearly sh shouts at you that you're looking at an old river bed and there are others flitting around here. Most of the others are the drainage dish ditches associated with, uh, in this case, probably fairly modern uh, boundaries, but some of them may not be, they actually may be older. Uh, it becomes a little more obvious when you look at the 1946 images yeah, and where you can still see that some of those stream beds are still a visible feature actually in the landscape. Human activity can also create ephemeral crop marks that are not always easy to explain. Uh, this particular one was pointed out to me from someone in the Darren Valley, which when I first saw it uh, had been completely baffled. Uh, it does look strikingly similar to uh, Ostia Ant Antica with this arrangement of kind of seeming paths and little sectioned maybe buildings and then these kind of almost like an arena, hippodrome, whatever. But with a bit of research it turns out that this field is actually used for uh, the Kent Heavy Horse Show every, every year. And so what I'm looking at in fact is the arena for the show with the entrance to it there and then a side arena and then a number of probably fairground, showground, walkways and possibly even a merry-go-round. These marks would have been very ephemeral and it was just pure <laughs> kismet if you like, it happened to be you know, photographed at this time because for the first set of rain these were all vanished. Equally confusing and giving you problems are old playing fields. Circular features can be found in old sports fields where repetitive white lining of football pitches around uh, central circles can compress the soil, leaving parch marks in dry years long after the field has changed use. In this instance, it's quite helpful the fact we still have a running track around here, which tells me in fact I'm looking at a sports field. But some of these otherwise would have been very hard to explain. But what we're looking at is the boundaries of various, well, you can see what may be a, a half circle for a uh, football pitch here. Although this is actually from the girls school at Benedon so um, I got slightly confused by one of them which turned out to be a lacrosse pitch which I have to say I'm completely unfamiliar with. But circles as crop marks can appear from uh, quite a, a remarkable number of different um, sources. This one which looks wonderfully like a parch mark but in fact, it's uh, associated with equestrian training. So novices would normally be trained to ride with a, a riding master in the centre with the horse on a, a lunge or a, a rope or fixed to the, uh, to the, the bridle of the, uh, the horse. 
and then it, it, they will trot and canter around in the circle being managed, if you like. And so one and a half tons of horse running around in a circle for extended periods of time can actually compact the soil quite remarkably. Uh, the clue here in some ways is, hey, well, it's OK, there's a jumping post there, but we've got um, another lunge training ring here. And you can see that the horse pastures are coming up in here, all this paddocking. So we know that there's something equine going on in here. And so that would explain almost certainly what that is. It's certainly not archaeology as we would know it. Elsewhere, uh, again, looking uh, following on from the horsey factor. Um, this is actually um, up in Chillingham on the Great Lines. And what happens here is that uh, horses are grazed by putting a central stake and then the horse is actually chained to the stake, so it actually browses into a, a circle. And presumably, in its efforts to actually get to the slightly sweeter grass just outside its reach, it tends to actually form quite a marked trample around the edges, which, again, when you first see it, does look remarkably like a cluster of Bronze Age ditches, uh, ring ditches, but it definitely isn't. This is very horsey again. In other instances, uh, you'll get rings that appeared to be archaeology, but in fact, again, are perfectly natural. This is a ring ditch of some 18 metres across, shown in the Moan Meadow in 2003. But when I looked at an earlier image, it's still there, but mysteriously shrunk. In fact, this one's only 10 metres across. And if I looked at the intermediate years, you see it's slightly bigger. So what we're looking at here, in fact, is something that they refer to as fairy rings. They're caused by fungi, which, and there are a number of species responsible, and some have no visible effects on the grass, but others locally increase available nitrogen, creating a positive crop mark. Whilst others in the group, the associated bacteria coats the soil with a waxy substance, making the soil particles hydrophobic, creating a parch mark. This photograph actually shows a small ring formed by a bluet fungi, and then these the ring expands at approximately a metre every year, so it just continually grows out and you'll get a larger and larger. So if you're looking at ring marks, it's always worth looking at an early year to see whether or not it has mysteriously shrunk. But not all ring clusters can be attributed to the fairies. This group is almost certainly an Anglo-Saxon barrow symmetry. The oblong or rectangular features within the rings are a significant clue, as is the closest of the rings and the fact that they form a cluster. You can see that there's a you know, quite a, a very tight group and they're almost touching. And inside some of them, you can just about make out what is probably the grave cut. There's no one there, no one there. The size is a little bit variable, but they, they're remarkably consistent between sort of like six metres and ten. Again, there's another ditch down here, which is substantially larger, and it seems to be a curious factor of um, Anglo-Saxon cemeteries that there's an, often an association with a much older prehistoric uh, burial mound of some kind and this seems to be the case here but these can't be confused with um, prehistoric um, ring ditches and I'll show you an example of what is probably a Bronze Age and again you can see that they're far more spread you know, it's very rare that they touch. They're also substantially larger. And in this instance, the central, which is probably a burial in here, is not um, rectangular or oblong, but a good deal more circular. You can also see that there, there are probably later uh, interments around the edge of the ring, here, here, and here, and there which is again not quite a common practice i believe with uh with certainly with bronze age barrows but again not all rings are actually barrows if i look at this one we can see the familiar ring of what might be a barrow but in the middle of it we have a kind of x marks the spot um the x actually is uh, the cross trees of a windmill so so post medieval windmills had substantial wooden found cross foundations which supported a central pillar 
on which the, the windmill actually stood and rotated round. What you're not clear about is whether or not that they've actually taken a Bronze Age or earlier um, barrow and recycled it as a windmill barrow, or whether or not that is actually the, the borrow ditch to create the mound for the windmill. Again, you can't really tell until you've actually gone and explored it. But it's more common to find the cross without the ring. So this is an example which is more well, a, obvious and more common. So it's not uncommon to find just the X. But again, you can see you've got the halo around it of where there was once a mound. So the game that windmill was still sighted on a mound. Earlier, when I was looking at um, the Isle of Grain, I did make a mention here of Ridge and Furrow. Ridge and Furrow is actually a very common distinctive agricultural feature of a medieval landscape. But Kent has been under such intensive arable cultivation that it's an extremely rare feature to the point where I couldn't even find an example in areas that I could reliably say was Ridge and Furrow. This example, in fact, is taken from an abandoned medieval village in Northamptonshire. What is notable, and if you like, one of the key features are these what they call the like stretched S curves, which are, if you like, one of the main signatures for Ridge and Furrow. Uh, so where you see this, there's a high probability that that's what you're looking at. There are a number of places in Kent where you appear to get ridge and furrow, but they're not. And so if I go to the next slide, which in fact is Nor Marsh in the middle of the, uh, the Medway estuary. Uh, it is now uh, salt marsh, but previously it was enclosed probably in the late medieval or possibly uh, even post medieval period. It was enclosed with uh, flood embankments. And, and put down either to grazing or agriculture. And what we're looking at here is kind of like artificial um, ridge and furrow that they've tried to drain and improve the soil by making shallow ridges uh, and furrows between them. The most obvious thing when you look at this is, is just how straight they are. They are there's no that sort of slight curving feature that you get on uh, ridge and furrow. That doesn't mean to say that there's no archaeology here, and this almost certainly was terra firma at some point. I mean, the whole area is well known for having a, a large number of certainly Roman uh, pottery kilns on these islands, and some of which have actually been excavated. But if you actually look at an earlier image of this, uh, before it turned to, uh, actually this is Spartina, which is a salt marsh, um, you'll see that here we're looking at a number of what are probably uh, salsa barrows. So certainly it was terra firma at some point in prehistoric terms. And that's a uh, fairly firm evidence of what you have. So this, if you like, are the drainage channels, but they were probably discontinued somewhere around about 1800. So instead of doing kind of artificial ridge and furrow, they started to build effectively uh, a different sort of drainage using ceramic uh, piping. So here is a, another wonderful example of one man working down a trench being observed by a large number of people with suits, uh, a site not unfamiliar with uh, modern roadworks. And he's actually putting down, in this case, circular uh, terracotta pipes in a long straight uh, drainage line. Uh, Sometimes these pipes that can be horseshoe shaped and some have holes in to actually for water to percolate through. But when it's finished and it's done, it generates and creates a very distinctive pattern. So when you're looking at uh, crop marks, and here is the example, uh, you've got this very distinctive herringbone effect turning up. And this is almost certainly uh, post 1800 and probably even later uh, drainage lines. Again, where this you've got archaeology underneath it, although strictly speaking, this is of course archaeology, but uh, if you're looking for something more ancient, it's extremely hard to see when you've got this interference pattern going over the top of it. And so finally, I come to my last slide, which is not exactly a word from my sponsor, 
But what you can achieve if you've got a lawnmower and a very good sense of um, I don't know, spatial awareness. So you can go out and create your own cop marks. This one, of course, will not confuse anybody. So at that point, I shall leave you and thank you for your time. Many thanks to Chris there for that um, presentation. Now, Chris has actually joined us uh, for some live questions and answers. If you want to submit any questions to him, um, that was a fascinating talk. Uh, as I say, I'm very uh, much into the archaeological prospection myself, um, be it on the ground with the near surface stuff. Uh, the the I have used um, aerial photography, but that I've learned an awful lot from that. Um, so I'm really excited to to kind of get on the 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 Google Maps with a glass of something fizzy and uh, just beaver away at it really. So Chris, um, can you tell us what what's uh, what's sort of uh, outcomes have you had from the work that you've done on this uh, crop mark analysis? Uh, can you think of anything particularly? Oh, um, not really. There's, um, only in the sense that we turn up an awful lot of very new sites. Um, I haven't exactly been keeping tabs on them. I think, uh, as an example, I think the first crop mark mapping was done in about was it 1968, I think, by the Royal Commission, and an analysis of that turned up in a suggestion that there are about 800 ring dishes in Kent. Uh, at the moment, I'm at around about 4,300. So there, I think, is a slight undercount in previous attempts. Um, other than that, I think we do quite surprisingly. I mean, the uh, the villa, I think, of Bourne Park is well known, but we have now identified at least another four that were not previously recorded. And we have turned up quite a few uh, potential Saxon cemeteries that weren't previously recorded. No, really huge ones. And I'd say enclosures by the dozen. I mean, that, uh, you know, that, that there's quite a lot of material that hasn't been known before. Most of it I actually just I send on to the uh, to be included on the her. You know, so rather than just sit here and say, ooh, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I actually send it forward to the, uh, the officer so it gets properly recorded. Yeah. I know that you and I have um had conversations about these before and uh, particularly with regard to the villa sites or potential villa sites on the main rivers in Kent uh, and I know that's uh, something that, that Lacey Wallace was uh, looking at particularly on the, the stir and um, you've you've had a lot of success for looking for things on on Medway and, and on the Darren. What kind of patterns have you noticed from those? I think the one that I wasn't expecting, I mean, everybody knows perfectly well uh, the number of Roman villas, particularly on the North Kent coast, that may be associated with some of the inlets and the close proximity to Watling Street. Well, I was a little more surprised to uh, find that there was an equally another string of them that run along the foot of the Downs. So all the way from Ashford, there's probably one almost every one and a half K right along the spring line going right away through to Maidstone uh, and onwards uh, through Snodland and then up to uh, Trossley we think is now at Burling and so on and then we've uh, and they come right the way around uh, through to the Sussex border so that I wasn't entirely expecting. Um, the other thing we noticed that was again a little surprise was that a lot of this information has been lost because it's on the map and if you look at it you suddenly it says Roman remains found here uh, and then they've been promptly lost. Um, they're not, uh, uh, yeah, they're, they, they're in the record somewhere, but they kind of got lost to general knowledge in a sense. So I think some of us are a bit surprised to find just how many there are. And there's a substantial cluster around Maidstone, but curiously there isn't a substantial cluster around Ashford. Um, so what's going on with Maidstone, I don't know. Um, well, I'm sure it's not house prices. The, um, so we were expecting to find a whole string like the Darrant all about the Stour, but that's proving to be very elusive. The one at Y you've seen, uh, I have found another one that's not too far away from it. I think at Biting, is it? Or Billy, yeah, which is uh, yeah. Yeah, a little further towards Canterbury, uh, and again in the foothills this time. Quite small. I mean, we're talking that like probably just a, you know, nothing very grand or grandiose. It's, you know, it's quite a modest little thing but it's definitely there. 
uh, but I found none between there and Canterbury. And it's the same, I think, that's why Bourne created so much interest, because it's the only one we know at the moment between Dover and Canterbury. Uh, there must surely be others. I mean, the Ellen Valley is just too uh, attractive a proposition. So sometimes I'm looking because I'm thinking there's going to be something, and then usually profoundly disappointed I can find nothing. <laughs> and other times things pop out the blue. So the one at Boxy, for instance, I was I only happened to look there because I went for a walk there and suddenly found a same pot on the ground and so I thought, hmm. Yeah, so then I went back and looked through all the photographs and sure enough, there's a um, there's a villa there. Well, at least we, so we think there's a villa. I mean, you were there and had a look at it. So there's definitely um, material in the ground there, but uh, whether it ever gets looked at, I don't know. Well, I think that's one of the most important uh, things to think about in terms of what you your approach. So we can be looking at it from, you know, simply skirting the landscape, looking for something that's brand new, never been discovered before, and then peeling that layer away to go in with perhaps some magnetometry survey resistivity uh, that's then maybe intrusive investigation with some evaluations or test pits uh, and then, then the next steps forward. But it can also work, as I said, kind of in the introduction, work the other way around. So if you are field walking, you find some material uh, in the field, uh, then you know get back to your computer, check the HER first, see if there's anything on there that uh, indicates it, and then you know have a look on Google Maps or I'm, I'm sure others are available, um, and see what uh, what you can find yourselves. No, this is very true, and I certainly welcome as many eyes as I can. I mean, people who find them and have uh, want to show them to me, I'd be happy to see them. Although I would appreciate if, like you say, they actually look on the her first. So rather than finding something that everybody's already found and sending me quite a large number of uh, emails with pictures on, it'd be quite nice to uh, just discount things that are already known. Mm. But yeah, I people do send me and I do find new stuff that I hadn't seen before. You know, it, it is. I've got on my system, I think, 12 years of different uh, aerial photography. So going through each one at a time on each field at each location is kind of, yeah, a bit of a long haul. <laughs> so looking somewhere where you expect it can actually give you a, a better reward. But every now and again, someone looks in their back garden, which I've never looked at, and say, have you seen this? And you kind of think, wow, OK. And that can set off a whole new train of um, examination to see if there's something else there. I mean, something like the, the, the Belt Valley was considered to be no crop marks. And yet all around Marden, it's actually quite rich. There's a lot of crop marks there, which was unexpected and including some significant enclosures. So there was obviously a lot of prehistoric activity in uh, the Belt Valley that wasn't really known. So yeah, these things are fun. And um, you've been doing it for a long time now, the, the developments in technology, not just in terms of just being able to, to see these satellite photographs and being public access now. Um, there's also drone technology, you know, if I, if I send a drone up and do a scan of a, an, an area of you know, 15 acres, it, it can do it in about eight minutes and, and then you can um, get back and see those results straight away and you don't have to wait for certain uh, certain companies to, to to load them up. You can also do it at certain times of day when the light's favorable when you've got nice long shadows or, or whatever it might be as well. So we can we can get gather more data that way. But so there's that technology which must have made a, a huge difference to to what you've been doing. But there's also the the technology in terms of um, geolocation, so georeferencing those results. And as you mentioned earlier, when People thought that a, a villa site or, or another building, something else archaeological, was in a certain place, uh, and now we have those geo-referenced images that are actually put in the right places. Um, how can how can we can we get that information across, and how can that benefit the HDR, for example? Uh, well, this is quite true. I mean, there are an awful lot of uh, extremely good uh, plans of excavations that have happened over time, even some fairly recent time. 
but they don't actually say where, if you sort of mean. I mean, they, we, we know they're in that field, but if you actually get, had to go back and relocate a, a section of it or a wall, you would have a bit of a fun time doing it because actually we don't actually know in that field where it is. It's in that field, you know, <laughs> and, and if unless you prepare to dig a, a sort of like 10 by 10 uh, trench to try and locate, you know, sort of a return of a wall, uh, you know, that's that's a big, big ask, you know. So if you've got properly georeferenced information, either from the survey, uh, I mean, from excavation or from properly um, geo-corrected aerial photography, you can make that life an awful lot easier. So you should be able to put in a little three by three and land straight on it, mm. in yeah. theory. <laughs> well, we, we have the technology, of course, don't we? We have it at the KAS. We have uh, geophysical survey equipment. We've got magnetometer. Uh, we have GNSS. So we can do, uh, we can record the locations of trenches that have been found. Um, if, you, if there are crop marks or any expectancy or, or suspicion that there's an archaeological feature in the landscape, uh, there are ways and means that, that we at the KES, we can we can help our members and our affiliates to, to, to investigate those further. Um, obviously, with the Google Maps, it's great because you don't have to ask the landowner's permission. Uh, but we're, we're we're obviously far more restricted in in that when you get sort of boots on the ground. Um, but yeah, I know you've been involved in some of the the survey work we've been doing as well um, at Lee's Court, for example, and 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 Oxford as well. So how's how has it the KAS's equipment and resources helped you at Oxford in that respect? I mean, Oxford, it would be I mean, as a classic example in the sense that uh, somebody did a, a very good uh, resistivity survey of it, which dictated where they put the first trial trench in, uh, because it was over what looked like a return of a, a, a building. Uh, they dug the trench and found absolutely nothing. That's because the uh, trying to get the resistivity meter information back into the real world coordinates proved to be slightly flawed. And it was out by about five meters, you know, and that's the sort of issues that you can have if you, uh, you know, if you if you haven't got proper georeferenced uh, material to work with. So now with the uh, GNSS, we can do several things. I mean, first of all, we can actually relocate um, the features properly, and so we don't get any possible distortions. But also, which is equally in terms of Oxford, we can also get levels because we've got a building here that's going up a slope. And each room has a slightly different level to the other one and trying to establish the level between the different rooms if you want to do a cross section say along one of the ranges that would be quite challenging to do without actually either getting a theodolite and the old traditional way of doing it you know sort of nice bit of a <laughs> hoofing it around I mean, we don't stretch the total stations but with the gns s you could just do it in you know you know half an hour you're done you've done the rooms you've done all the levels you've got all the corners you know it's magic almost um, and it's the same uh, we used it in Bourne to actually create a, a very high uh, resolution terrain map so we were taking sort of three meter um, z measurements as we just striding across I mean, of course it records x and y so we'd be able to generate a, a, a really good DTM from it so yeah in many ways it's a, a superb and you say the drone is helpful. Um, drone maps have issues of their own though, uh, but the problem with aerial photography, you're down to pure dumb luck. If the, if the bloke who had been commissioned to fly it happened to fly it at a convenient moment in a convenient place for something you've interested in. And I think out of the set of 12 or 13 uh, different years that we've got, only about four have crop marks. Yeah, that show up consistency, consistently. Right. Yeah. So that's quite a low hit rate. You know, so and some of them actually show crop marks where they didn't appear in others. Mm. But most of them are just repetitive. You know, you always see the same ones. Uh, so drones theoretically should get, get us around that. But getting a drone up at the right time means you've got to see that the crop mark is there, which in the game is requires you to actually go down and have a look quite regularly because the they appear quite quickly and they disappear even faster. Yeah, so your, your time slots are, are, are tricky things to manage. Mm. Uh, 
I, as you know, I'm, that's where I met you. Actually, was at Bourne Park. I was lucky enough to uh, to be part of that team that dug the uh, the villa at Bourne Park, and um, it's probably where I really got a, a big interest in in crop marks and in archaeological prospection. Um, and it's some amazing results that, that Lacey got those different techniques, the GPR and the and the um, resistivity. Um, and it, it must have been really satisfying for you having seen these from the air and then getting them ground truth in that way. Oh, oh, most certainly, especially as the first set I saw for the 1990s, we sent to a certain archaeological unit who said they were probably from a marquee associated with the uh, with the uh, with the cricket pavilion, uh, which was a bit of a downer. <laughs> but fortunately, uh, yeah, four years on, we suddenly discovered, of course, that, that, that there's something else there. So uh, that was quite nice to uh, actually find something rather than just be, yeah, the crop marks of a marquee. <laughs> <laughs> so breaking down um, perceptions as well. This is probably the same sort of people that say that ge geophysical survey doesn't work in Kent, apparently. Really? <laughs> Apparently, yes. uh, those beliefs are still held. <laughs> well, there are certainly there are certain soil conditions that make it easier, shall we say? And there are certain soil conditions that make it a bit of a challenge. I mean, we have looked ourselves because we looked at the. Uh, I can see the crop mark at Boxley, the shape of the building, but we went over it with a mag and saw nothing. Mm, absolutely, yeah. That's yeah. Enough. So you don't get a coconut every throw. I think is the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, I'm looking through the question and answers. We don't have any um, live questions from our viewers, but we've still got people attending. So um, it's uh, it'd be great to hear from you if you've got anything to say to Chris. Um, so have you got any plans to to target any of those um, potential sites that you've been looking at now? What's the next stage? I think the, uh, there's some that we've found that uh, would certainly benefit from uh, at least in the first instance a field walkover to confirm that the structures I'm seeing are potentially Roman in the first instance. I mean, I've got, I mean, I mean, I've got some definites. I'm absolutely convinced I know what they are. I've got some that mm, I'm not sure what that is. It could be, and those I think particularly be worth the uh, visiting if we get an opportunity. Um, well, and not just, I mean, Roman ones are fine because they actually tend to be a little bit more obvious. Um, if you've got a, a very nice enclosure, the snag is, you can see it's an enclosure, but even if you actually went and put GFIS over it, it wouldn't necessarily tell you much more than you've got an enclosure. You know, so there's some things that you, at the end of the day, the only way you're going to get any answers of it is that you get the spade out and make a hole. You yeah. know. Yep, you've got, to, you've got to do it the old fashioned way. <laughs> well, there are plenty of people waiting in, on the sidelines after the year and a half that we've had with their buckets and their kneelers and their spades ready to get stuck in. Absolutely, that includes me. <laughs> well, um, I think uh, we might be planning to do some survey in uh, Lee's Court this year. It's all, you know, everything's a little bit unsure at the moment, So, but hopefully we'll be have some low level um, sort of investigations there. Um, anything there that's taken your fancy without being too specific? Well, I think uh, 22 Corners Field, I'm fairly sure has an enclosure in it that doesn't look like a ring ditch and doesn't look like the other feature that we've got opposite Stringman's. He says, putting it delicately, but the um, uh, so that one, I think, will be very interesting. I mean, the problem with prehistoric is that uh, on the ground, it doesn't actually necessarily show you much. You know, so uh, chances of actually just kicking the sod and turning up a chunk of um, a Bronze Age pot is pretty slim. <laughs> um, well, that, that's kind of, to some of us, that's the allure of the prehistoric archaeology. It's the, it's the ephemeral nature of it and uh, the unknown going into the unknown. Yeah, there's no other solution other than you say to you, get your trowel out. <laughs> and then you find, of course, it's not Bronze Age, but Neolithic. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that'll do for me. I can only say that. Okay. Well, um, well, thanks ever so much for Chris giving out your time, Chris. It's um, immensely useful. And uh, as I said in a couple of posts that I put out about this, 
it's really for everybody. You know, we anyone who's got an internet connection can go on to look at these satellite images. Um, and I know that uh, there's a lot of people that, that spend a lot of spare time going over these images and just uh, thinking, you know, is it worth writing a letter to the landowner? Maybe they'll let me have a walk over and see if I can find anything. Um, maybe more, who knows? Uh, but uh, it's, it's, as I say, it's, it's extremely uh, useful to us to understand more about how this works, why these crop marks are there and what they mean. So um, if there's a if there's anything that anyone's got that they want to send you, how would they go about doing so? Well, uh, they should be able to get my um, email address, I think, for the KAS. I think I'm up there somewhere. Yeah. Is probably... okay. um, I, it is there, isn't it? I mean, I'm yeah, saying yeah. it. Yeah, you're, 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 you're on there with your biography. OK, well, um, again, thanks ever so much. Um, and thanks to everyone who's um, watched this video and watched this presentation. Uh, it means a lot of us, a lot to us uh, to get your support. And uh, as I said, there are plenty more coming. We will be um, getting some more talkers. We've got one from Rochester Cathedral and uh, a couple of other guest um, uh, speakers as well. But if anybody out there wants to talk about their special subject and um, take questions and, uh, from our, our audience, then please get in touch. Uh, you can email me, Fred Birkbeck, at communications at kentarchaeology.org.uk. And uh, I'll be very happy to hear from anybody who's got any suggestions about that. Uh, there will hopefully be some volunteering opportunities uh, in the field, but there are certainly volunteer opportunities available um, to help with some of the the functionality and the running and the documents. Chris is very, very heavily involved in our website uh, development in terms of uh, loading site reports and other um, really important archaeological uh, information onto our website. We've been building up this database uh, that you can search geographically for reports or um, studies that have been done in particular areas. So we're going to be hopefully hard launching that at some time of the year, but we need people who are interested in uh, digitization and helping out with things like that as well. So please don't be shy, get in touch with us. Um, it will be uh, rewarding, uh, help us get all this fantastic information about the archaeology and history of Kent out to uh, the public. And um, it will also um, be something that you will maybe learn some new skills from as well. Um, so please keep in touch and uh, keep in tune with our Facebook page and uh, the, the videos as they get loaded up as well. Thanks ever so much for taking part and for joining us and we'll see you next time.